First case is a 46-year-old male with chest pain after a cardiac catheterization. Next case, 43-year-old male with heart murmur on echocardiography. Twelve-year-old girl with history of hypertension. And we also have a axial black blood MRI. Next case, 17-year-old, history of prior motor vehicle accident. We have some reconstructions of a CT and an MRA. Thirteen-year-old with acute chest pain. Sixty-five-year-old patient with acute chest pain. Three-month-old baby with cyanosis. Next case, 21-year-old woman with history of wheezing. These are coronal black blood images. And we have some axial black blood images. Next case, 36-year-old man with murmur and uh, normal echocardiography. It was referred for a cardiac MR and those are the findings. Thirty-five year old cardiac murmur. Thirty-six year old woman with history of congenital heart disease. And finally twenty-six year old female with dyspnea during jogging. Oh, there's one more case. Ten-year-old, non-cyanotic patient. Okay, so let's start with our first case. This patient is a 46-year-old, had a cardiac cath, and was referred for a coronary CTA for evaluation of this abnormality. So what, this is a curved maximum intensity projection we can see the left main coronary artery, LAD, and circumflex. And we see this focal area of dilatation right at the bifurcation. Uh, in the volume render image, we again see that focal dilatation, uh, and this is consistent with a coronary artery aneurysm. So uh, it's usually caused by atherosclerotic disease, but uh, also a very common cause is a traumatic or iatrogenic aneurysms, as seen in this case. Patients with uh, some types of vasculitis can also present, particularly Kawasaki disease can present with coronary artery aneurysm. The diagnostic criteria is a diameter larger than 1.5 times uh, the size of the normal lumen. Uh, and it's very important to get a very precise measurement of that aneurysm because based on that, uh, the clinicians are going to decide if the patient needs to be anticoagulated or not. And 8 millimeters is the threshold for anticoagulation. Now, this is our next case, 43-year-old May with murmur. So if you remember from Monday, um, we reviewed uh, a systematic approach to plain film in acquired heart disease, and we started uh, defining if the patient has a small heart or a big heart heart disease, and this patient has a normal heart size. Now we look for signposts, and the signposts are left atrial enlargement and ascending aortic enlargement. And we can see here uh, left atrial enlargement, a double counter. We can see compression in the esophageal um, 
encounter in the Laro film. So uh, this is a small heart heart disease with a signpost pointing to the mitral valve. This is consistent with mitral stenosis. Another finding very commonly seen in patients with chronic mitral stenosis is an enlarged main pulmonary artery consistent with pulmonary arterial hypertension. Enlarged left atrium, normal heart size, enlarged main pulmonary artery. Just to briefly review a small heart heart disease. Left atrial enlargement, think mitral stenosis. Aortic enlargement, you think aortic stenosis. And if there's no signpost, we're going to think myocardial and pericardial diseases such as acute myocardial infarction, restrictive cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and constrictive pericarditis. Next case, 12-year-old with hypertension. So if we look closely, we're going to see this a very typical sign of coartation, which is an inverted tree contour of the descending thoracic aorta. Uh, it's hard to see from uh, the distance, but we can actually see some irregularities in the inferior aspect of the ribs, uh, also consistent with coartation. The axial black blood image demonstrates a normal diameter of the ascending aorta in a very narrow descending aorta. Now here I have some sagittal uh, images of the MRI, black blood images, demonstrating the coartation. An important thing when we describe this is to say this is a juxtaductal coartation uh, and how far it is from the origin of the left subclavian artery. And this is important because of management. If you're going to put a stent to open this coartation, the clinicians need to know how far it is from the left subclavian artery. Another important role of MR in patients with coartation is to measure collateral circulation. And this is important to determine if the coartation is, is hemodynamically significant or not. So we measure blood flow immediately distal to the stenosis and at the level of the diaphragm. Here we have a magnitude and phase images uh, of the descending aorta. In this patient, we got a flow versus time curve demonstrating a much higher blood flow in the distal descending aorta compared to the proximal descending aorta. Now, my question for you, is this coartation hemodynamically significant? Uh, and your answer should be yes. It is because we have uh, blood flow coming through the collaterals to the descending aorta. Therefore, the diaphragmatic flow is higher than the proximal descending aorta flow. So MR is important for coartation to determine the site, severity, and extent, and to measure collateral flow to assess a functional significance. Uh, also, in the post-treatment evaluation, we can detect recurrent coartation and complications such as uh, patch aneurysm formation. Next patient, 17-year-old, prior motor vehicle accident. So uh, we can see this enlargement of the left upper superior mediastinum at the region of the aortic arch. We can also see that in the lateral film. The, recon the sagittal reconstruction of CT demonstrate again this um, dilatation in the inferior aspect of the ductal region, a little bit of calcification, and the MRA shows exactly the same finding. So this is typical location for a traumatic pseudoaneurysm. Uh, the locations where the aorta is usually um, injured during trauma is the aortic annulus, the ductal region, and the diaphragmatic uh, hiatus. Just to review, aortic pseudoaneurysms can be caused by infection, penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer, and can be traumatic. Uh, it can be acute or chronic. In this case, it was a chronic uh, trauma, and this patient had that for several years. Um, it's actually a disruption of the wall, and it has a high risk of rupture. Therefore, it's very important to communicate this diagnosis. Uh, one of the imaging characteristics is a narrow, narrow ostium of attachment with the vessel, which is not clearly seen in this case, but the location makes the diagnosis of a pseudoaneurysm uh, most likely here. Next patient, 13-year-old, acute chest pain. So there are two things we have to... Um, identified in this case. One is, of course, this huge dilatation of the sinus of Valsalva. And note that the aorta uh, becomes normal in diameter uh, above the sinus tubular junction. At the level of the right pulmonary artery, the diameter is normal. So this is consistent with the diagnosis of 
uh, anal aortic ectasia. Uh, as you know, these patients are prone for a dissection uh, and rupture of the aorta, and here we can see an intimal flap at the level of the ACNA aorta, so type A dissection. Note that the flap does not extend inside the left main coronary artery, but it does extend to the ostium. So anal aortic ectasia is usually seen with connective tissue disorder. 50% uh, of the patients have Marfan syndrome, but it can also be seen with ehlers Danlos syndrome. Uh, the pathology is cystic medial necrosis, uh, and this can also be seen in patients without connective tissue disorder. Uh, patients have an increased risk of uh, dissection and rupture, and one important um, information that we have to give from the chest CT is the diameter of the ascending aorta. Uh, patients with a, an aneurysm of the thoracic aorta, uh, the number we have to uh, be concerned about imminent risk of rupture is six centimeters. Uh, however, for patients with anal aortic ectasia, the threshold is lower, so patients with a five centimeter uh, aneurysm will be submitted to surgical procedure. Next case is very straightforward, 65-year-old with chest pain, and we see a dissection of the uh, thoracic aorta. So the points to make here are uh, the compression of the true lumen. So note that the true lumen is usually deviated anteriorly and medially, and uh, it's significantly compressed by a false lumen, which is partially thrombosed, as you can see here. So here we have the left carotid artery, left subclavian artery. The dissection starts immediately distal to the left subclavian. So um, as you know, it's a type B dissection. Um, hypertension, atherosclerosis, anal aortic ectasia, and vasculitis uh, are associated with the risk of aortic dissection. As you know, type A dissections, uh, Stanford type, involve the ascending aorta, and the management is usually surgical, whereas type B dissection uh, involves the descending aorta, and usually no surgery is recommended. It's medical, medical management. Now, whenever we see an intramural hematoma, which I don't have an example here, which is a disease in the spectrum of the dissection, uh, we can also uh, classify this intramural hematoma in type A or type B, uh, and the management is going to be similar to the management of uh, dissections. What are the complication, complications associated with a type A dissection? So these are aortic valve rupture, a pericardial hemorrhage, coronary artery dissection, and carotid and vertebral artery dissection. Uh, we usually do cardiac gating in all the dissection, uh, the studies performed to rule out dissection, so we can clearly evaluate the aortic valve and the coronary arteries. This is an old study from 1996 that already showed how good helical CT is for diagnosis of aortic dissection with a 100% sensitivity and specificity compared to MR and transesophageal echo. Now, congenital heart disease plain film. So whenever we see um, a case, we have to look for three things. The presence of cyanosis, uh, the heart size, and the pulmonary flow. So this patient has cyanosis with increased pulmonary vascularity, as you can see here. So this can figure a type four lesion, one of those uh, differential diagnoses includes the T lesions, as you remember, of course, from Monday. Uh, and we have to look at the superior mediastinum to see if it's narrow or dilated. This is a narrow superior mediastinum. So this patient has a transposition of great arteries. Differential diagnosis would be truncus arteriosus, transposition, total anomalous pulmonary venous connection, and tingle ventricle. So um, this is an axial CT demonstrating a detransposition of the great arteries. We can see the aorta anterior to the pulmonary artery and to the right of the pulmonary artery. So this is usually seen with a complete transposition. Just to remind you, the complete transposition, the left ventricle connects to the pulmonary artery, right ventricle to the aorta. And we talked about that on Monday. Usually these patients are gonna have post-surgical complications. In the arterial switch procedure, you're gonna look for pulmonary artery stenosis. In the atrial switch procedure, you're gonna look for right ventricular dysfunction, baffle stenosis, and clot formation. Next case, 21-year-old with wheezing. The coronal image is not really helpful, but uh, we can actually see 
two vessels adjacent to the trachea, one on the right side and one on the left side. The axial images are much more helpful here, and we can see a right aortic arch and also a left aortic arch to the left of the trachea here. Now note that the left aortic arch is interrupted. So there is a tresia of uh, the left aortic arch, and this is very commonly seen. Um, the right aortic arch, whenever you have a double aortic arch, as in this case, the right aortic arch is going to be the largest aortic arch. And the most important problem here is going to be compression of the airways. So if you follow the trachea, we can clearly see uh, impression of the trachea by the right aortic arch, so it's, it is narrowed. So to review, the aortic arch anomalies that could cause vascular rings are a right aortic arch with an aberrant left subclavian artery or a double aortic arch like I just showed you. The imaging goals are to identify the arch anomaly and to document the airways compression. Next case. 36-year-old murmur in a normal echocardiography. So we're talking about a shunt that could not be detected by echocardiography or an occult cardiac shunt. Um, here we can see a coronal MRA demonstrating superior and inferior pulmonary veins connecting to the superior vena cava. So this is a partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection. Now, very commonly associated with this abnormality is a sinus venosus type of ASD. When we look at the axial CD images and black blood image, we can see a communication between the superior vena cava and the left atrium. So this is a sinus venosus AST. And here again, we can see the anomalous pulmonary venous uh, connection to the left atrium. Occult shunts, the primary imaging method is echocardiography. MRI is useful in those hard cases hard to diagnose with echo, such as sinus venosus ASD, partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection, and supracrystal VSD. And MRI is very important uh, to quantify the, the systemic to pulmonary venous uh, flow, to quantify the hemodynamically significance of the shunt, and to measure uh, the function and the volume of the ventricles to see how, um, what are the effects of the shunt in the uh, cardiac function. Here's just one more example of a partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection to the superior vena cava in a coronal MRA. Next case, 35-year-old cardiac murmur again. So again, our approach to acquire heart disease in plain film uh, analysis, and we can see is this a small heart heart disease or a large heart heart disease? So this is definitely an enlarged cardiac silhouette, so we're talking about large heart heart disease. Uh, any signposts? Do we see left atrial enlargement or aortic arch enlargement? Yes, we do see aortic arch enlargement, which points us to the aortic valve with a large heart within aortic regurgitation. So just to remind you, big heart heart disease, left atrial enlargement, we think mitral regurgitation, aortic enlargement, ascending aortic enlargement, we think aortic regurgitation. When no signposts are present, myocardial and pericardial disease should come to our mind, and idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, ischemic cardiomyopathy, also tricuspid regurgitation, that wall-to-wall -wall heart that I showed you on Monday, uh, right ventricular failure can have this presentation, and of course, a differential diagnosis should be made with a large pericardial effusion. Next case, 36-year-old, congenital heart disease. So this is a kind of a complicated case. We have four axial images of a black blood uh, cardiac MRI, uh, and I'm going to show you what the findings are. So this is a pulmonary atresia with VSD. It's the more severe form of tetralogy of flow. Uh, so we see the perimembranous type of VSD and the right ventricular hypertrophy, as we see with tetralogy of flow. We see the ascending aorta overriding the defect, so an overriding aorta. Now, we don't see the main pulmonary artery in this uh, slice here. Next slice, we see a very small main pulmonary artery uh, with very small branch pulmonary artery. So this is consistent with pulmonary atresia, as opposed to subpulmonic stenosis that we usually see with tetralogy of Fallot. Now, in patients with pulmonary atresia and uh, ventricular septal defect, 
we commonly are going to see what is called a systemic to pulmonary artery collateral. And here we see these huge vessels coming from the descending thoracic aorta to the lungs. This is very important for surgical planning. Uh, and we have to uh, determine where the collaterals are and what's the course. Here again, we see a uh, coronal MRA with two very large systemic to pulmonary collaterals. Just to remind you again, tetralogy of LO, VSD, overriding aorta, pulmonic stenosis, which is usually infundibular and right ventricular hypertrophy, the right arch is seen in 25% of the cases, and a severe variant is what we just see. We just saw a pulmonary atresia with VSD. Next case, 26-year-old dyspnea during jogging. The first thing that has to call our attention here is the enlargement of the right ventricle. So this person likely have a shunt, a type of left or right shunt that is enlarging the right ventricle. So we look at the atrial septum and we see a defect. So this is a secundum type of ASD, the most common type of ASD, and can be clearly seen in this uh, cardiac MR image. Now, MRI can also estimate the systemic to pulmonary artery uh, ratio, blood flow ratio. And we do that by measuring blood flow in the ascending aorta and in the pulmonary artery using velocity encoded CINE image. Here we have our flow versus time curve with blood flow in the pulmonary artery and blood flow in the aorta. So in this case, the pulmonary to systemic flow ratio is 2.1. So very significant uh, shunt. Next case, 10-year-old, non-cyanotic, again, our congenital heart disease approach to plain films. Uh, and we're going to look for, first, is the patient cyanotic or not? So it's a non-cyanotic patient with increased pulmonary vascularity. So that already makes the diagnosis of a group one lesion. Now, to remind you, we have to look for signposts. And here we have an enlarged left atrium with a uh, double counter uh, in the anterior projection. So this is our uh, differential diagnosis in patients of, with a type one congenital heart disease lesion. Increased pulmonary flow, non-cyanotic. These are gonna be the most common uh, lesions uh, and these are the shunt lesions. So we're gonna look for signposts. No signposts, these patients are gonna have ASD or a partial anomalous pulmonary venous connection. If the left atrium is enlarged, we're gonna consider VSD and, and patent ductus arteriosus. If there is an, also an aortic arch enlargement, patent ductus arteriosus is most likely, uh, whereas VSD is most likely if there's no aortic arch enlargement. So this is a VSD case, a group one lesion. The left atrium was enlarged, but there was no aortic arch enlargement. So that's why we know it's most likely VSD.